Il y a beaucoup de choses auxquelles nous croyons, surtout parce que nous avons envie qu'elles soient vraies. En anglais, cela s'appelle le « wishful thinking », le fait de réfléchir à travers le prisme de nos souhaits. L'exemple le plus frappant de cette pratique, sans doute, est la croyance en la vie après la mort, en la résurrection ou la réincarnation, en le paradis et en un Dieu qui a un projet, un destin pour nous. La plupart des religions enseignent l'une ou l'autre version de cette doctrine de la vie après la mort. Comme le dit le philosophe Sam Harris, si cela était vrai, cela reviendrait à une violation de, pour ainsi dire, toutes les lois de la physique que nous connaissons. Néanmoins, certains essaient d'utiliser les outils de la science et de la technologie afin de fabriquer, si l'on peut dire, de l'immortalité, au lieu de simplement croire très fort qu'elle existe. Mon invité pour cet épisode, Michael Schama, s'est penché sur de tels projets et les a trouvés spectaculairement optimistes dans leurs objectifs. Il défend une approche plus lente, pas à pas, que la médecine peut suivre pour aider les gens à vivre une centaine d'années en bonne santé. Comme nous l'avions appris dans un épisode précédent avec Steven Pinker, le processus d'amener l'humanité à vivre plus longtemps et en meilleure santé est déjà en cours avec beaucoup de succès. There are many things in which we believe chiefly because we want them to be true. This is called wishful thinking. Maybe the most striking example of this is the belief in life after death, in resurrection or reincarnation, in heaven and in a God who has a plan for us. Most religions teach one or another version of the doctrine of the afterlife. As philosopher Sam Harris has put it, if this were to be true, this would violate just about all of the laws of physics that we know. However, some are trying to use the tools of science and technology to manufacture immortality, instead of simply wishing it into existence. My guest for this episode, Michael Schirmer, has investigated such projects and found them to be widely optimistic in their goals. He advocates a slower, step-by-step -step approach, whereby medicine helps people approach or reach, say, a hundred years old in decent health. As we have learned in the previous episode with Steven Pinker, this process of achieving longer lives in a healthier state is already underway with much success. Uh, hi everyone, I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. Michael Schirmer. Dr. Schirmer, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, you are nice the, to see you. Yeah, <laughs> nice to have you on. So you are now the, uh, well, you, you have been, the, the, and you still are the editor-in-chief of Skeptic Magazine. Uh, you graduated with your PhD in 1991 from Claremont Graduate University. And the title of your dissertation was Heretic Scientists, Alfred Russell Wallace and the Evolution of Man, a Study on the Nature of Historical Change. Uh, you're also the author and editor of many books, including The Skeptic Encyclopedia of Pseudoscience, which was published in 2002, The Believing Brain, published in 2011, and The Moral Arc, published in 2015. And uh, so we very briefly met one week ago exactly when you came to give a talk at the Deutsche Amerikanische Institute in, in, in Heidelberg. And you were discussing... Uh, in, in this talk, your last book, Heavens on Earth, which was published earlier this year, and you kindly agreed to come on the podcast. And so in this book, among other things, you discuss uh, belief in the afterlife. And maybe you could start by talking about your own uh, background, so to say, because you have yourself been uh, a strongly believing Christian, and uh, I suppose that entailed. Uh, belief in the afterlife? Uh, certainly, yeah. Uh, for almost all religions, the afterlife is now part of the worldview. It wasn't always that way, as I document in the book. Uh, ancient Jews, for example, didn't believe in an afterlife, and, and the early Christians, their version of an afterlife was rather different than it is now. So the fact that the afterlife has evolved, or it has a history, is rather telling. Uh, I mean, it's not like the history of cosmology where we discover things that get us ever closer to an accurate model of the universe. There's no such sense of progress in understanding um, the afterlife or immortality. Every religion's different. The afterlife versions are, are, are different from each other, often mutually um, contradictory. So that, yeah. that tells us something. In, in my case, it wasn't something I gave, gave much thought to when you're young, you know. So while I was um, 
I was religious in, in uh, high school and college. I, I wasn't always that way. I wasn't raised religious. My parents were not religious. Uh, for me, it was more influenced by my peers, and I got into uh, Christianity, mainly interested in the theological debates over God's existence and free will and the problem of evil and all those those big issues I thought were super interesting. And I wanted to be a college professor, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll major in theology and I'll do that. Uh, but then I discovered you have to have a PhD, and to do that in theology, you have to master Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and Latin, and I could barely get through Spanish, so <laughs> I thought I have no chance of doing these languages. So I switched to psychology as an undergrad, and there discovered uh, the scientific method, you know, that you know, actually running experiments and testing hypotheses. And I thought, this is a better way of understanding the world than theological disputation and debate, which has a role, but um, it's not as good as actually running experiments, in my opinion. So I switched majors, and ultimately that led to my loss of religion, becoming a nun, no religious affiliation, and then ultimately an atheist. And that, that whole process was about seven years in the making. So I was in it long enough to know what it feels like to be in the bubble and to believe, uh, like everybody else in your bubble, and how how good that feels, how reassuring uh, it is and, and reinforcing of the, the, the different dogmatic points that define your religion. And inside the bubble, the, the worldview is pretty coherent and internally consistent. It isn't until you step outside of it and you really explore the criticisms and the debates that people have that, <clears throat> you know, with an open mind, that you realize, okay, this this just can't be true in, in a scientific sense. Um, you can say it's psychologically true or or mythically true or true for me at this point in my life, something like that. But that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to know, if, is it really true? I mean, is there really a God out there somewhere? Is there really an afterlife uh, that you go to afterwards? And and that sort of thing. And, and I decided that, you know, from a scientist perspective, you, you can't conclude that there is. And in science, we start with the null hypothesis. That is, your hypothesis is not true. Now, you have to prove otherwise, and we'll accept your proof if you show us your evidence, show us your, your data, your experiments. And then we reject the null hypothesis that, you know, the 0.05 level or the 0.01 level of confidence in their statistical analysis and so on. And there's just nothing like that when you're talking about the resurrection of Jesus or, you know, these kinds of claims. You know, where's the control group? <laughs> you know, we have an N of one and a story that was told, you know, decades after the death of the Messiah and, and all that. It's just not not good evidence from a scientist perspective. So while I recognize that people get value out of it emotionally or they might say it, it's true for me and I'm not claiming anything beyond that, then like, OK, whatever. But most, particularly in the West, especially in America, the, it, the claims go beyond that. They, they really they want it to be really true. I mean, out there true. Like there really was a guy named Jesus. He really was crucified. He really res was resurrected. He rose from the dead. He went to heaven. And the reason he did all this was to atone for our original sins and, and, and the whole package. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that intersect, those claims intersect with what I do. Uh, you know, as a publisher of Skeptic Magazine, uh, they're making empirical claims, and, and that gives us the right to say, "Where's your evidence?" Sure. Okay. And there is also, I mean, before we um, maybe get to the core of your book, there's also another instance. Uh, at least I'm sure there's others, but another noteworthy instance where uh, you've changed your mind. Uh, you use not to be convinced by the um, evidence on uh, global climate warming and you have changed your mind on this um, on this issue and I was yeah I was wondering if you could also speak briefly about this uh, change yeah. of mind um, <clears throat> the change of mind idea is I think is important in our toolkit of skeptical critical thinking that is when someone makes a claim you can just you can always ask well, what 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 would it take for you to change your mind about your belief and that really sets people thinking like hmm I don't know I mean most people say I have no idea uh, I just believe it uh, well, think about that. What would it take to change your mind? <laughs> uh, you know, could you be wrong? Is there some way to falsify your claim? You know, and this is the Popperian test of 
of uh, the demarcation between science and non-science? Is there a way to test it and falsify it? And as Popper expressed it, you know, science is a, a process of conjecture and refutation. So scientists are conjecturing all the time. Most of their ideas are probably wrong. And, and the refutation part is the testing experiments and so on. And what's left standing that isn't refuted, we can't say it's true with a capital T like in a theological sense, but we say it's not false. It's maybe true, probably true, 90% true, probability, you know, and so on. And so with things like the theory of evolution and the theory of the Big Bang, Big Bang theory, um, the germ theory of disease and, and so on, plate tectonics, geology, uh, the age of the universe, the age of the earth, these things we, we, we have, we can say with a high degree of confidence they're true. Not absolutely, counter evidence would be disruptive for sure. Um, but uh, that's as good as it gets in science. So when things like, when you ask, is, you know, is global warming real? Well, or do you believe in global warming? It's a it's an odd way to phrase it. It's the way Americans ask the question, you know, mm -hmm. do you believe in global warming? It's not a belief. You know, it's not like, do you believe in liberal democracy? Do you believe in civil rights? It, it's not like that. It, it, it's either getting warmer or it isn't. And it's either human caused or it isn't or some percentage of natural causes versus human causes, something like that. And um, and to that extent, you know, I just follow the data. It wasn't, in, in this particular case, I didn't have a dog in the fight. I, I didn't really care one way or the other. It wasn't like I was committed to it not being true or anything like that. Uh, so I was happy to change my mind, whatever. I just, you know, looked at the evidence and said, oh yeah, yeah, it looks pretty, pretty obvious it's real. Yeah, and I've done that with a number of things um, in, you know, as over the decades, um, like gun control. I used to be just, you know, no gun control, just, you know, libertarian people just do whatever they want. Well, I don't know if that's such a good idea now. Um, you know, things like that. I, you know, it's perfectly okay to change your mind. Okay. Uh, so maybe finally we can um, get to the book itself. So the title is Heavens on Earth, and the title is The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. So maybe we can go through these three uh, rubrics one by one. Um, you already briefly discussed the afterlife uh, at the start of our conversation, but um, yeah, maybe we can dig a bit deeper and um, start by saying, so I don't know the, the, the statistics although I can, I can have a strong guess, I think, throughout the world. But in your talk, you gave some statistics that most people in the, in the United States, for instance, uh, do believe in the afterlife. Yeah, that's right. So uh, it varies uh, by country around the, the Western world and, of course, in other countries as well. Um, but just within um, the Western world, Americans... You know, believe in an afterlife. They believe in God and the afterlife more than Europeans do. It's an interesting question why that would be, because mm -hmm. say 50, 60, 70 years, well, just say post World War II, right after World War II, the you know, percentages of belief were about the same, but Europeans have gone undergone quite a quite a dramatic shift. Not all countries in Western Europe, but most of them. Mm -hmm. You know, people, the majority of people don't believe in God. They don't adhere to a religion. They don't believe in the afterlife. And and one of the consequences of that is they, they want to make this life better, you know, by having, um, you know, a better society, a fair, just society for more people. This is one explanation, that, that when your government takes care of the poor people, and people that are mentally ill, physically handicapped, unemployed for whatever reason, you know, have a hard life, um, then there's no reason for religion to do that. Because um, that's what religions traditionally have done is take care of poor people, say, man, the soup kitchens and so on. So if the government does it, what's left for religion to do? Because religion's role as an explanation for the world has already been replaced by science. And, and pretty much everybody agrees on that. Uh, except for fundamentalists in America, the young earth creationists. But um, so, you know, that's one explanation uh, for that. Now, the percentages of belief are still nevertheless fairly high everywhere that there is an afterlife, including, amazingly, that atheists and agnostics, when asked, um, you know, do you think that, well, they don't ask, the, is there a heaven? 
the question was worded, do you think that consciousness continues after the death of the body? And about a third of atheists and agnostics agreed to that question. So now what are they thinking? I don't know. This survey didn't ask, you know, like what, what is it you have in your head that you think is going to happen? But I suspect, because I meet a lot of these people, that it, it's something like a quantum consciousness kind of a Western Buddhism, Deepak Chopra, you know, the your consciousness returns to the quantum field state out there somewhere in the ether. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and it, it always existed before the physical instantiation of it in your body, and then it will continue on afterwards. And this is just a temporary staging area on Earth and a physical manifestation. Um, and, and with so I suspect a lot of people think something like that. But also I know because the core of my book is that people that think that not that it's going to happen inevitably, but that we have to make it happen. Uh, And this is, you know, cryonics and transhumanism and radical life extension, uh, the mind uploaders, you know, all all these um, attempts to defeat death, defy death um, scientifically, technologically. So. I find the, the whole movement fascinating because I'm a big pro-science guy. They're big pro-science people. They love science and technology, and I do too, so okay. And it's not that I'm against it. I, I think it would be great if they were able to solve specific problems along the way. Um, for example, you know, prostate cancer for men, breast cancer for women, Alzheimer's, dementia, senility, you know, th- brain diseases especially. <clears throat> I mean, what's the point of living 500 years if the if the last 400 of the years you don't even have a memory because your mind is gone? Okay, there's no point. So we have to solve those specific problems along the way, and and the billions of dollars being poured into these companies that are funded by, um, say, Peter Thiel and and Jeff Bezos and the Google boys at uh, at Google. And so on. This is good because um, setting aside for the moment, you know, they're going to defeat death and we're going to live forever a thousand years or whatever. Setting that aside, because I think that's unrealistic um, on any horizon for any of us alive today. But if they can solve specific problems and get more and more people up to the upper ceiling, which is about 115, 120 years um, with a quality of life. Um, you know, so when they people say, Shermer, don't you want to live to be 500? It's like, look, just get me to 90 without cancer. Get me to 100 without Alzheimer's and then we'll talk mm-hmm. and I'll let you know how it's going then. Um, I, I was just on stage with Dawkins in Berlin, as you know, and and uh, so we were just talking about this and he said 200. I'll go for 200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, 200. That sounds like a good round number. Uh you know, but we'll see. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not as optimistic as Ray Kurzweil is. He's the guru of the singularity. Mm-hmm. And uh, his idea that I talk about in the book is, is this takeoff point where that the um, – say you take your average life uh, span of humans today in the Western world, about 80 for women, 76 for men, whatever. And every year that goes up a little bit. Say it goes up a month. Every year. Well, what if it goes up two months every year and then six months every year and then nine months? And then at some point, if it goes up one year every year, then Mm -hmm. you get to live forever. Now, one flaw in this reasoning is is those statistics apply to people that are born that year carried out, say, in a century. That's how long they'll live. Not you and I, me, I'm 64. Kurzweil, I think, is 70 now. Mm. That's not going to apply to us. Uh, So, um, but even so, I, you know, again, I like the idea of, you know, if you can extend uh, any of our lives as we get older, replacing parts. I mean, I have a titanium hip, for example, and it's great. Uh, You know, more of that, the better. Solving specific problems. I call this protopia. Instead of aiming for utopia, which doesn't exist, protopia, where we just make a little bit of progress every day. And uh, so while I'm skeptical of the scientific attempts to achieve immortality, I'm in favor of the medical and technological uh, attempts to solve specific medical problems. Mm. I've seen one argument according to which um, uh, senescence or aging, uh, you know, if we hadn't heard about it before, which seems completely, you know, implausible as a hypothesis, but imagine somehow that we wouldn't have heard about it, uh, if we were described all its symptoms, we would consider it as a disease and try to yeah. try to cure yeah. it. 
That's right. And that's how people that work in the business treat it. It's it's just yeah. another uh, technological problem, an engineering problem, bioengineering problem, uh, or in this case, really genetic engineering problem. Um, because the, the senescence is built into our genome. It's built into the whole package, the whole physical package by evolution. So I, I discuss this in the book at length that, you know, why do we have to die? Infants and young children, you know, their cells divide like crazy and, and just it seems like indefinitely and they're healthy and strong and growing and, and they get little cuts and they heal like overnight. It's incredible to watch. Um, how come I can't do that? You know, in my 60s, how come uh, uh, my cuts heal much slower? And and the answer is, is because I'm now at the point where in terms of evolutionary perspective, um, you know, I, I would be, say, if I lived in the Paleolithic, a grandparent or maybe a great grandparent in my late 60s and 70s. After that, there's really no use for me anymore because the parents and grandparents have already invested a lot in getting the current generation's offspring, uh, the genes into the next generation. So there's no reason to allocate the resources to keeping a body super young and healthy for hundreds of years when the job is already done mm. uh, at say a, you know, if you live 50, 60 years, you, you're pretty, as far as natural selection is concerned, your job is done. You've gotten your genes of the next generation and your offspring's offspring to reproductive age by the time you're a grandparent. That's it. You're, you're done. <laughs> Uh, and it's really it, it, the way I say it is like there's somebody up there like making the calculation for energy consumption and so on. And of course, natural selection doesn't do that. There's nobody in charge. It's just an algorithm that grinds along for whatever works best for getting uh, the genes into future generations. And so we have to die simply because um, we're not useful anymore after at some point. And and it isn't about our bodies, as you know, Richard Dawkins makes this point in The Selfish Gene, take it from the perspective of the gene, not the body. The body is just a vehicle that carries the genes. The bodies are mortal. Genes are immortal. So the species, as long as it doesn't go extinct, is immortal. It just continues on forever. Um, yeah, but bodies are dispensable. And that's why we age and have to die. Okay. Because you are very... Um, well, <laughs> very skeptical uh, about the uh, technical feasibility of all these avenues, the, the, the very am ambitious ones, at least. These problems are way harder than they're made out to be. When you really yeah. look into them and you talk to aging experts and geneticists and so on, they just shake their heads and go, you know what, <laughs> they're not even remotely close. You know, this the Aubrey de Grey, who I like very much, um, and I admire his his work to, to attempt to defeat aging. His, he has these, his SENS program, S-E-N-S, these seven different things you have to do all within the cell. Um, and, you know, I look at the seven, it's like, okay, this looks great, let's do it. And you talk to aging experts and they go, we're not even remotely close to doing any one of the seven, much less all of them. Mm. So, you know, we have to be realistic. Okay. So maybe we can get back um, a little bit to um, the more classical or the more sort of traditional belief in the um, in the afterlife, the religious ones. Uh, you also noted in your talk that um, more people seem to believe in heaven than in hell, which is <laughs> yeah, you know, optimism bias. Yes, <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know if there is uh, a single religion that has a heaven but no hell in the uh, sort of uh, well, Buddhist, uh, I mean, Buddhists and Hindus and Taoists and so on, their their conceptions of these things, including mm -hmm. God, are so different from Western yeah, yeah. religions that you know most Westerners don't really get it. You have to really get into these religions to understand what they're talking about. Uh, so I mainly focus on, um, you know, the monotheisms because they're. The, their conceptions of the afterlife and immortality are, are fraught with logical problems. The same kind of problems that the mind uploaders have. That is, what yeah. what is what is being preserved, whether you call it the soul or your connectome, the connectome being the copy of all your synaptic connections that represents all your memories, um, is that really you? Like for, say, for, for religion, for Christians, uh, when you're resurrected, so this was a big debate for 
for centuries in the Christian religion amongst theologians. What gets resurrected? Is it your physical body? I mean, you're dead. You're in the grave for a couple of days or a couple of years or maybe a couple thousand years or whatever, and then God takes you up out of the grave and into heaven. Well, what's up there? I mean, your rotted body? No, that can't be. So it, it must be you um, like you are now. But wait, when now? How old are you when you're up in heaven? Well, they determined you would be 30 because <laughs> 30 is a good year. You know, you're physically strong and your memories are good. So well, they, they actually concluded that because Jesus was 30 when he was crucified and resurrected. OK, fine. Uh, but say I'm 64 now. So what happened the last 34 years of my life? Are all those memories just gone? Because those memories are stored physically in my brain. We know that. For sure. So if you're just resurrecting my 30-year-old body, that you've missed a lot. You know, that's not really me. Me is now with the whole package of memories of my whole history. Um, and so this gets to the problem of identity. And so in the book, I, I introduced this through the Star Trek conundrum that start, that Trekkies like to debate in, in the transporter. You know, when Captain Kirk gets transported to the planet, what's there at the planet? Is it his atoms that get scrambled and moved? Or is he copy and pasted? Um, and then where's the original? And so the original would have to be destroyed, and every copy of Captain Kirk would just be a copy, and copy and copy and copy every time he's transported or whatever. So but it's the same problem, moving somebody from here to heaven. Um, so here I make a distinction between the point of view self and the memory self. So the mem self is the copy of your connectome. Fine. That's part of you for sure. But it's not all of you. There's your point of view self, the you looking out through your eyes. So the continuity of yourself from one moment to the next is what constitutes your life. Now, if that's disrupted, say, in sleep or anesthesia, it's OK because it comes back uh, pretty much intact in the way it was. Your memories fade or change. But, you know, there's kind of a core you that you think of. That's me. Now. If you were copied in a, um, say, a, a scanner or, you know, in, in, the, in the way this is conceived of with the mind uploaders is that we scan your connectome and digitize it and put it in the cloud. And now we have a copy of every one of your memories. That's you. I contend, no, that isn't you. Because if we did this while you were still alive, say in a sophisticated fMRI brain scanner a century from now or whatever, and you're still standing there going, well, here I am. And the copy is up there going, no, no, I'm the actual Michael Shermer. And I'm going, no, dude, no, no. <laughs> I'm the real one. You're just a copy. Now, the copy may think he's the real one. But I, the real one, knows as long as I'm still alive with the continuous self from one moment to the next – now, there may be multiple copies, so what does it mean to be you if there's more than one you? Now, with twins, this is this conundrum is resolved by the fact they're not actually identical, and in any case, they're two separate autonomous persons legally and psychologically, so it's not really an issue. The idea with immortality in this scenario is that you continue on just by copying you in, in, into more uh, stable mediums like you know, silicon chips in a computer or the cloud or whatever. But I contend that I seriously doubt you would wake up in the computer, like waking up from your sleep. And, and you wouldn't be like inside the camera hole here looking out going, here I am. <laughs> Uh, because if you were alive, when we scanned you, you'd still be sitting there going, no, 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 this is me here. Anyways, but I think religions have the same problem. Mm -hmm. You know, what's up there? And yeah. uh, this whole problem of identity is, uh, I think, a serious one for both religions, religionists and scientists. I thought about the family meetings in heaven. I don't know if people have discussed this point, but, you know, if you are 30 and your parents are 30 and your children are 30, this will feel uh, pretty strange, I would say. Weird. There's other issues. Uh, Christopher yeah, yeah. Hitchens makes this point about, you know, the Christian heaven being like celestial North Korea. Yeah. You know, you, you live in the dictatorship where you have this all-powerful being that knows all your thoughts and controls everything you do. Well, that doesn't sound good. Um, or as he memorably phrased it. Yeah. What most people fear about death is they're at the party and they get tapped on the shoulder and say, you have to leave. The party and worse, the party's going to go on without you and everybody's going to have a good time and you don't get to participate. And so people feel bad about that, understandably. And he mm. says, OK, let's let's turn it around. Let's say you're tapped on the shoulder and said, 
the party is going to go on forever and you can never leave. <laughs> well, that, that may be even worse, mm. you know, um, you know, forever is a long time. So, you know, yes. again, these, these things are just the, the moment you dig deep into it and think about it, it's like, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. Right. Yeah. I think we cannot begin to have understanding of what it, this eternity really feels no. like no chance of being able to imagine that. Well, and this is another problem is imagining not being alive. You can't do mm. it yeah. because to imagine something you're alive. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's like, it's a little bit like it's how I start the book actually, you know, imagine mm. there's no universe, What you mean no stars and planets. No, 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 no light, no space and time, mm. nothing, not even, you can't even say the word nothing. There, there's just, no thing there's you, know, you can't at some point you just hit a, a linguistic and epistemological or cognitive wall where you can't even really think about it and that's what death is like you can't conceive of it just you just stop existing in, in the same way that you can just ask well where were you and you know, people ask where, where, where do you think you go after you die the same place i was before i was born mm. and most people go what <laughs> but but i didn't exist before i was born right Yeah. yeah, yeah, and well, it, it's a different uh, issue, but uh, I mean, yeah, probably it's very difficult to, or impossible to imagine what it's like not to exist, but what I was, yeah, trying to say is that um, maybe we, we have, we, are, we tend more to think that we are able to imagine what it's like to live forever, but uh, Yeah, I contend that this is really impossible to, to... I have a quote in my one of my yeah. epigrams for the book. I forget it was Seneca or one of these ancient Greeks mm -hmm. or uh, Roman philosophers that um, you know, all other animals are immortal yeah, yeah. in the sense that they have no idea they're going to die. So as right. far as they know, this just goes forever and then <laughs> till it doesn't. And then they don't, but they don't even know that it, it ended. Mm. We're the only species that realizes, oh my God, this is all going to come to an end. Holy crap, what does it all mean? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's in part why we have religions that try to answer those questions. Mm. So we have discussed uh, the afterlife now, also immortality uh, to some extent. I guess we could, um, we could talk about utopia uh, if you want. Well, I added, this, I added this section to the book because... Um, I'm interested in the subject, and it's related in the sense that one of the things that the ancient Jews did mm -hmm. uh, before the idea of heaven was even invented was um, they didn't have a conception of the afterlife. It's like this life is all we have, so we have to make a better world. Now, I agree with that. That's right. Uh, that's the subject of my previous book, The Moral Arc, you know, how we are shaping society to be a more fair and just and equal society. And we have been doing that. Well, we have a ways to go. But this idea of not only can we make a better world here, we can make a perfect world, you know, a heaven on earth, literally. Um, and, and there the problems start <laughs> because there's no such place. That the word utopia literally means no place, uh, as Thomas More initially conceived of it in his first novel of that title, where the word comes from, it doesn't exist. And the, and the reason is, is because we're too varied in our uh, interests and needs and desires and abilities and so on, that, um, you know, the, the, the idea of design in a society from the top down that is perfect for everybody forever is impossible. But so basically, I document all the attempts in history to do that and why they've always failed. And therefore, why we should work toward protopia rather than utopia. Just a little bit of progress such that today is slightly better than yesterday and tomorrow is slightly better than today. And at some point, and I don't even want to say we'll get there because there's no there there to get to. It's just that life will continue to get better for more people in more places. And that's all we could do. And, and that's good enough. This is also the, the thesis of... Um... Steven Pinker and his recent books, one can think about um, The Better Angels of Our Nature, also very recently enlightened now. And uh, he's faced quite a bit of pushback for pointing out that things have been getting uh, broadly much better for most people. Have you also faced pushback by, by people who, you know, think that maybe this seems to 
positive to, to be true. Maybe they think <laughs> you would be naive to think that this is the case. They, they do, yes. Uh, I do get pushed back like Steve does. Uh, I'm, I signed on uh, with, with him. We are rational optimists in Matt Ridley's phrase mm -hmm. by his book title. Um, you know, not just Steve and I and Matt, but, but you know, uh, you know, humanprogress.org and, mm -hmm. you know, our world and data, Max Rosen's uh, site. There's a lot of people documenting this. The data is real. Um, it's really, in my opinion, indisputable. Things mm -hmm. are better than, than they've ever been for more people in more places. Now, what about Ferguson? What about police shootings of black citizens? What about um, Brexit and Trump? And what about, okay, fine, Syria, Putin. Yes, of course, it's not, uh, it's not a steady, perfect curve up. It's more like the global warming curve. It's kind of jagged up and down, up and down, up and down, but the overall sawtooth blade is upward. So. Think of it as three steps forward, two steps back, you know, and, and, and so we're always going to be pushing back against, um, well, as, as Steve characterized it, it's a constant battle between our better angels and our inner demons. And those inner demons, tribalism, xenophobia, racism, bigotry, these things are, are, are kind of built into our nature for very good evolutionary reasons. That is, the world's a dangerous place. There's a lot of ways to die. You have to be super risk averse and careful, especially about other people in other tribes, because they may want to kill you, and they did. Um, so there's good reasons for these things. And and so the, the whole point of civil civilization is to figure out how to push those down, attenuate those inner demons, and bring out our better angels by designing these choice matrices that make it that give you incentives to behave good. So having laws and having police and, for example, is a way to get you to obey the laws. Now, religion adds to that by pointing out there's an eye in the sky watching you at all times, even if you think you got away with it, you didn't, because God saw, it, saw what's going on. Okay, that's one of the origins of religion. But in the modern world, we also do things like in America, for example, uh, you know, today that we're recording this is, um, you know, Tuesday, uh, what do they call it? Tuesday, give, Giving Tuesday. So today is the big day when you're supposed to give to charities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, I follow uh, Peter Singer, and he has a nice site where he lists all the charities that he and his team have p picked out as the ones that are most likely that your dollar will be put to the problem and not supporting payroll and buildings and yeah. and first first class travel and things like that. Um, but that but but I get an incentive to do that. If the more I give, the more of a tax write off I get. I get to deduct that from my income at the end of the year. Now, the government has done this because they want us to be nicer <laughs> and more generous and they give us an incentive to do so. Much like there's a break if you get married. I get a tax break for being married. Um, I get a tax break for owning a house um, in, in, in terms of I get to deduct the interest on my mortgage. So, you know, civilization has you know, hundreds and hundreds of little ways to kind of um, attenuate the inner demons and accentuate the better angels. And I think they're, I think the better angels are winning ever so slightly. <laughs> mm. And so the pushback comes from people legitimately pointing out, well, what about this bad thing over here? Yes, we should do something about global warming, the threat of nuclear weapons, possibility of AI. Yes, yes, yes. All these things are real. Um, you know, the plastic in the oceans, you know, and so on. These are real problems. So we should address them. Yep. Uh, but, don't, but, but don't mistake one piece of bad news as a trend downward, backwards from progress. Yeah. It, it could be that, uh, you know, there is this impatience in, that we, I, I guess, all have to some extent, to various extents, uh, which, you know, causes us to think that this is essentially what you just explained in, in, in other words, but uh, this impatience that would cause us to think that if things are not uh, perfect, so to say, then probably they are not so good, uh, which, you know, is linked to this um, drive for uh, utopia. Exactly, right. If, if, you're, if your standard is perfection, we're always going to fail. Right. And it's always going to be uh, looking like it's bad. Also built into is the fact that the, the media covers only bad things that yeah. happen. And it's not that that's wrong. That's what their job is. But it's the job of historians and futurists and scientists to say, well, let's actually look at the data. 
uh, and see if it's true or not. And in most cases, the things that are reported, there's an increase in police shootings of people, whatever, you know, these things tend not, not to be true or in perspective, you know, it's a minor blip in a long-term trend. For example, in 2015, 2016, there was an uptick in uh, inner city um, homicides in just a few cities like Chicago, for example, had a huge homicide problem. 2015, 2016 related particularly to drugs and inner city gangs with guns. But when you when you when you look at it on the curve, and it looks like there's a blip. And it's like, oh, my God, Americans are killing each other more than they used to. No, not Americans across the board, just some a handful of people in Chicago. And they you can actually narrow it down to certain blocks like this corner right here has an increase in homicides and gang-related activity. So let's go park a squad car there, and the police will get out, and they'll stand there. And all of a sudden, the figures go down. So this is called smart policing, and there's computer programs that do this for um, city police, and they do that. And that's what causes the numbers to go back down. So it's really just a matter of problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, yeah, which <laughs> I also asked this to uh, Steven Pinker, but I think it's... Um... Yeah, I want to hear several people's thoughts on this. I think it's, uh, it's. I'm thinking about this quite a bit because I would, I would say that to some extent, uh, you know, since the age of the Enlightenment, religion has seen its influence on people, its influence as a as a tribal marker, as you know, the guide to people's beliefs and sort of a an obstacle to them accepting the best available evidence so religion you know it still is that but probably to a lesser, lesser extent in the western world than it was a few centuries ago my question is um and yeah do, do you think that politics is now sort of standing in the place where religion used to be in that respect whereby it does um you know prevent us to, to a large extent from being more objective, if not fully objective. Yeah, yeah, I think some political debates have become almost like religions, like commitment to environmentalism is kind of a religion for some people. Commitment to being anti-GMO and pro-organic foods. You know, those are, that's a, the, when you talk to some of these people, it's like their religion. Uh, and, uh, and on the on the right, you know, like commitment to free market ideology, that's like a religion for some people. And I think uh, what we're seeing in particular with the, the kind of decline of religion's power is it being replaced by these, you know, secular uh, mm -hmm. ideological debates. You know, for for Americans anyway, guns. It's not about guns. Guns are just a proxy for something like freedom, liberty, free markets, capitalism. You know, they, they represent something that people feel deeply passionate about. And when you're so when you're debating guns or climate, for example, I've done debates on guns and climate with, with people on the other side. And, and I can see that it isn't that isn't what it's really about for them. Mm -hmm. It's like with create. I used to debate creationists in the 90s and you know it really wasn't about darwin dna you know paleontology the fossil record it was nothing had nothing to do with that it was that you know if you accept evolution and darwin then this is going to lead to a materialistic atheistic worldview with no objective morality or right or wrong and that's bad for me my family my society my country my nation blah 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 And so it's like they're being given a choice between Darwin and Jesus or something like that. And uh, so they, they don't know anything about evolution because it's not about that. And, and same thing with climate. Most people don't know much about climate, but global warming is a code word that gets auto-corrected in the brains of conservatives to say, oh, you're in favor of big government intervention in the marketplace. You know, I believe in free market capitalism and industry and the American way of life and the American dream. And you just want to destroy that. <laughs> and so, again, they don't have to know anything about parts per million of CO2 gases or the ice core data or anything like that, because it's not about that. And guns as well. You know, the, the people I've debated on guns, it wouldn't matter. I mean, now it's about 30 
7,000 people died of guns last year in America. 37,000. That's more than died by cars. Wow. Now, about two-thirds of those are suicides, but nevertheless, mm-hmm. it's, it's still a huge number of people died by homicide and accidental gun. It wouldn't matter to pro-gun people if it was a million a year. You know, I want my guns because they represent freedom and, and self-defense and autonomy and, you know, that kind of thing. It's a, so the gun is a proxy for something else an ideological, moral value that they don't want to give up. So when we debate these people or talk to them, we have to recognize that and work around it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, to Christians, I say, you can keep Jesus, the soul, the afterlife, God, the whole thing. Uh, But just think of evolution as God's way of creating life. And and, and so accept the science. And then we're talking about the science. And and then it's okay as long as they don't feel they have to give up something. Okay, that's, uh, yeah. An interesting lesson, I guess, very, uh, very pragmatic, so to say. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, we, we live in the, in the real world where you have to <laughs> engage people, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have reached the end of my questions. Yeah, well, that's good, and my, my, my little boy just woke up, so now's a good oh, time to, Okay, yeah. so then the timing is great. Okay, thanks, Vincent. Yeah, thanks a lot. By, by the way, my son's name is Vincent, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Small world. Well, right. Cool. Okay, well, let me know when this is posted, and I'll uh, punch it up on social media and all that. For sure. Sounds great. Okay, yeah. thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.